people tend to think that abuse is just related to um, being abused physically, but in essence, that's really not true. It's not, yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, there, abuse is not just physical. There's mental abuse. There's verbal abuse. And um, even witnessing abuse is a form of abuse because all of these um, can cause post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, even witnessing it. So... We also help, we're, you know, we also help people like that as well. As a matter of fact, in one of our meetings, we had an individual who came in who was not sexually abused. She was physically abused and verbally abused. And it affected her the same way as it affected someone who was sexually abused. You know, all these things triggered PTSD. So you're absolutely right. Abuse is not just physical, you know, um, and you said something, um, I believe you asked, how would I, how would I help someone who is unsure, who who is unsure that they were abused? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, there have been instances where... Where someone will, someone will just um, have a, a trigger of, say, for instance, um, let me see, how, how can I put this? A lot of victims that experience abuse have triggers, flashbacks, you know, right. maybe something that we said or something that we've done, maybe a smell or something that triggered an experience of abuse. That's how you know um, a person that is um, suffering from PTSD. Um, It may be an experience of childhood where you saw your father beating your mother and um, now you're an adult and you get into uh, an altercation with your spouse. And all, uh, and all of a sudden, you feel like a victim, like you've been abused. Right. That is called flashbacks. Right. Triggers. Right. Um, there has been instances where a person will, a person will, um, will remember that they were abused at the age of three or four, you, you know? Because of a, a trigger. Right. There have been people that, a lot of, um, part of PTSD is the one, um, it's suppression. Mm-hmm. When people were suppressed, um, and kind of like forget what happened to mm-hmm. them. Right. Mm-hmm. And a certain, certain things may trigger those memories. And now they, they're they starting to remember what happened to them. That has happened a lot. Mm-hmm. That has happened a lot. So, um, yeah. our support group, it really helps individuals who, who suffer from, from PTSD. Research indicates that support groups are one of the best tools for people that battle with depression, anxiety, suicide. And when God gave me um, this vision, he told me to start a support group. You may not be certified as a psychiatrist, but there are ways that you can help. And the support group has helped a lot of survivors begin their healing journey. Wow. That's amazing. Because there's so much depression going, like you know, happening when when you don't talk about what's going on within you. Right. And there have been people that signed up for this group who realize, man, like this thing has really affected me. It, it's affected my relationships. It's affected, you know, um, it's it, it, 
it affected my finances. Like these PTSD affects you in many ways mm-hmm. that you won't even understand. Right. A lot of victims, they go from relationship to relationship. They can't keep a job. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's so much psychological damage there. And if you don't begin the healing process now, then it will it will completely destroy you. Right. And and I want to be a beacon of hope to people to tell you, no, you don't you don't have to allow your experience to dictate your life, to ruin your life. Like you can overcome this. And for people who can't afford a therapist, who can't afford a, a psychiatrist, I'm here to tell you that healing is free. Mm-hmm. Right. The word of God says healing is the children's bread. Mm-hmm. The word of God says that a broken spirit and a contract heart, God will not refuse. Like, there is healing. <laughs> there is healing in Jesus Christ. Like, it is as healing is absolutely free. Mm-hmm. And I am a living testimony of that. Once you can control the way you think, once you can control that, then... You can control anything in your life. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. So wow. we also teach that cognitive thinking. Mm-hmm. How to think positive. Once you think positive, then, then positive attracts. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. That is such a that is such an amazing um it's such an amazing work to do, to be involved in. It's so, it's so, um, it's, it's so, uh, multi-leveled. Um, uh, I mean, it's a lot of work and how do you protect yourself spiritually? Because doing this type of work, um, in the nonprofit sector of any kind, you're dealing with people that are hurting you know, from various reasons. And um, how do you protect yourself spiritually and emotionally? You know, because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's like you go into work with your, you have to have, and I'm sure your armor is, you know, the word of God and your faith. But can you just even share, you know, what you do for your own mental and uh, mental and emotional protection for other people that may be endeavoring to go into the nonprofit sector or even this particular part of the nonprofit sector helping um, people that have been abused. What do you do to protect yourself? How do you endure? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, but you, you pretty much answered it. <laughs> um, um, like you said, the word of God. The word of God is is my armor. That is something that I stand on because, like you said, you're you're pretty much going in the battlefield. You're dealing with so much brokenness, so much hurt, and and you're pretty much invading Satan's territory because he wants to see people down. He wants, I mean, because this whole thing is a silent epidemic. This is a big fight, and to try to get people to open up and, and share their story, it's a it's a battle because mm-hmm. Satan uses this as, you know, as a tool to destroy people silently. People are suffering silently. And um, what I do is I just, I just stay grounded on the word of God, fasting, praying. Um, and another thing is I practice cognitive thinking, you know, thinking positive, feeding myself positivity, even when things are not going right, even when, when, when things, you know, even when there's warfare, like I just stay grounded on the word of God and feed my spirit, um, you know, the word of God, (laughs) that's pretty much, I mean, I really don't, that's, that's the most powerful tool. Right. So do you, so you, so I'm, do you have to pray before you go into, like, you start your morning? Do you have to get up and do, a, do you have any particular, uh, particular regimen that you follow? Uh, 
that you say, okay, before I start this workshop today, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z? Or, you know, is there a regimen that you follow to keep your mind stimulated and thinking positive? And, and you know, I know you said you practice cognitive thinking, but what's your, what's your regimen that you follow to, to go into the battlefield? <laughs> I mean, one thing, one thing that I do is before I do anything that is pertaining to Fortress of Oak, I fast. Oh, okay. I fast. I deny myself of any earthly pleasure, and I feed myself with the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God, and I just allow God to inhabit, to just consume every part of me because I want to be led by His Holy Spirit because I cannot heal people on my own. Right. But only through the power of God. Mm-hmm. So what my regimen is, before I step foot on any stage, any platform, even doing this interview, is that I deny myself and I fast and mm-hmm. just allow the Holy Spirit to just have his way. Because I know on my own, like, I'm a mess. Like, I can't even, <laughs> when I get nervous, I stutter, I, you know, I... I'm a mess without him, without his Holy Spirit. So what I always do is I fast before any event, before my workshop, before my support group meeting. I fast and allow the Holy Spirit to take over and consume and consume me, so that so that I can be an effective tool to minister to those who are who are hurting. Wow, wow, that is amazing, and. As far as coming out of the situation and now being able to move forward with life and you've forgiven, um, you've forgiven the person that, that victimized, that, that victimized you and, um, how do you deal with family members that you say swept it under the rug? Um, I noticed that in situations where, you know, something, it's something, you know, as they say, everything done in the dark eventually comes to light. So when this thing comes to light, and, and I'm asking you to share this with others because people will want to know, you know, well, I, I'm, I want healing, but why should I forgive? And how do I continue to talk to so-and-so when, you know, her husband or my brother-in-law did this to my, my child or, how do I forgive and go on with life and still be a part of this family? You know, how, what do you, what, how do you do that? How do you now interact with people that swept it under the rug who essentially it's like either, either may have made you feel like you don't believe me or made you feel unloved because they didn't bring it to light and stand up for you. How do you do, how do you deal with that? And what do you recommend to others? Wow, that's that's a good one. That's a very good one. Wow. Well, the first thing I would say is that forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. And the first step to healing is forgiveness. One can't get one can't do one without the other. And forgiving, like I had to come to a point where I forgave my family because they were all they all contributed. They enabled this, you know, mm-hmm. and I was very angry with my family at one point of time. Like, I wanted to run away from them and just isolate myself from them because they enabled this behavior. And I had to come to a point where I forgave them. Now, if it's an instance where, where, the, where this abuse happened to your child, now, you still have to forgive, but forgiveness is not always reconciliation. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that people do, you know, get confused. Just because you're forgiving them does not mean you have to put yourself back in that situation, especially if it's an endangerment to your well-being or your child. Mm-hmm. So it is important to know that. You can forgive, but forgiveness is not always reconciliation, but it is imperative that you forgive if you want to begin the healing journey. 
And another thing that people don't realize is about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a daily process. <laughs> right. Each morning that you wake up, you have to remind yourself, today I choose to forget. Right. It's an ongoing process. You Because the, the memories will come. You know there's a saying that says forgive and forget? Well, first of all, I want to let the world know that that is not <laughs> That's not true, quite true. That is not that is not biblical. Yeah. <laughs> it is impossible. Right, right. It's impossible to forget that we wouldn't be human. <laughs> right. But, but there is a way to forget. Like, you have to constantly remind yourself when these thoughts come up mm-hmm. that I choose to forget. I choose. We have to make a conscious decision to re forgive right. daily. Right. Because the word of God says that we must cast down every imagination, every vain thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we know that God is big on forgiving. He didn't say that you're going to forget about what happened, what happened to you. He just wants us to make a conscious decision that I will, I choose to forget. Right. Because not only is it good for me, but it brings peace. Right. Peace within the family, peace within, you know, it just, it brings peace. Mm-hmm. So, if, if you are a parent and, and, and this thing happened to your child, choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. And forgiveness does not mean that the person should not pay the consequences for their behavior. Mm-hmm. That's another thing. Because one thing that that um, we went over at, a, at our last workshop is because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of survivors who can't get over their situation because the abuser is still walking around free. Right. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we taught um, at our last workshop is that. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if it's been 30 years or 50 years since you're, since you're abused. Mm-hmm. If that perpetrator is still walking around, then you can still report them. Because if they got away with it, with you, mm-hmm. more than likely there's, there, there's other victims out there. Right. So by you taking a step and reporting them, Now, there can be an ongoing investigation, and believe me, others will come forward about their abuse. That's why I'm so big on this, on encouraging, empowering people to speak up. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, I don't know if you remember the statistics, 96% of abuse happened within families. Mm -hmm. Right. So, a lot of times, survivors, you know, they're afraid to talk about it because they know that by by reporting this family member or this close friend of the family, that it can ruin lives. It can it can draw a line between it can it can cause chaos. Right. And then I, I think I think you said something very important when you said forgiveness also brings peace. But I think a lot of times that people think about the aftermath and they're like, OK, let's just restore peace in the family. Let's just, you know, get over this. But when something goes unreported, as you said, it makes the the victim still feels um, victimized. victimized. And although you although the family or you know, the group of adults around are saying, okay, we're going to bring peace. This happened. We're going to let it go, move on with life. But you also said forgiveness does not necessarily mean that reconciliation has to happen. So I'm thinking that some people, and and I'm no therapist, but I'm thinking that what what a lot of families or people in general, uh, the point they miss is that Because we forgive, we don't have to start going back over to so-and-so's house and having barbecues 
and yeah. chilling out like nothing's never happened. Because I think that what I think um, a, a, the, another message that people in general are missing is that, OK, you're forgetting how this is going to make the victim feel. You know, you yeah. it's almost like and I and I. And this is something that probably goes on a lot. I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me like a lot of families just want to co- want to pretend like nothing never happened. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then it hurt. And then although there's forgiveness there, but it's still damaging to the victim because the <laughs> the victim. It's almost like a wife going back to her husband after he beats her and continues to verbally abuse her and she continues to go back to him and forgives him and although he may not you know he may not do it anymore but she's still remembering all the times that he did he might not do it for six months but she's still having flashbacks about the last two years where he beat her so um what as far as forgiveness not meaning reconciliation um, can you send a message to maybe families or people who are forcing the victim to still participate in family activities or um, encouraging the victim to still, you know, befriend the people that have victimized them? What would you can you send some type of message to get them to understand that that is, you know, what would you say to that uh, situation like that? Well, one thing I would say is that when you do that, the sign that you're send, sending out is, is letting the, the victim know that you're making them feel worthless. Mm. You're making them feel like the you're making them feel like protecting the abuser mm. is more important. Protecting the abuser and the reputation of the family is more important than their well-being. And what that does is re-victimize them. Wow. And it makes them feel worthless. It makes them feel unloved. And that's what you're doing when when you do that. Wow. And not only that, is you're condoning that behavior. Wow. Mm. You're abiding to their code of silence. Mm-hmm. You continue to perpetuate that behavior. So... You're doing more damage. You're doing just as much as damage mm-hmm. as the abuse. You know how they say um, when there's um, a murder case, how they say um, that you're, uh, what is that word? When you contribute to the, to the, to the crime. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. That is what you're doing. Mm-hmm. That is what you're doing. Wow. Mm-hmm. So if you love that person, and even if you if you love, I mean, what this? Let me tell you why this is such a a hard topic because a lot of times it it draws. You have to pick sides. Wow. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of times. I mean, it causes a division within family, yeah. especially when it's a uh, um, um, situation of incest. It, mm. it causes division, and can you imagine what that victim is feeling? Because now you feel guilty. Not only does the victim feel guilty for telling, because now they're guilty for breaking relationships. Wow, yeah. Yeah. So now they carry all this guilt and shame, and, and some victims feel like, man, I wish I never told because now, mommy would have never, mommy wouldn't divorce daddy, or you know, or um, uncle wouldn't, you know, get kicked out of the house, or you know, it's a lot of these situations, it causes a division within family. So now, in cases where it's swept under the rug. Now, not, not only does the victim regret telling about the situation, but now they're carrying guilt, shame, and chances are they may never open up about the, the situation again. Yeah. And I'm going to use my experience as um, an example. For instance, 
as I told you, when I reported my abuse, it was swept under the rug. And as a result, the abuse continued. And because no one did anything the first time, when he continued to abuse me, I stopped. I didn't tell. Right. I kept silent. Right. Because I knew that it was my word against his. And if they didn't believe me the first time, uh-huh. they won't believe me this time. Yeah. So he continued to, 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 to molest me. Right. Over and over again. And so I got tired of it, and I I told again. And this time, they moved me out of the house. Wow. And mind you, now they moved me out of the house thinking that that, that would stop him. But guess who helped us move furniture to the new house? Wow. He wow. And he continued to come over there and, and do the same thing over and over again. Wow. So now I told you that he's still molesting me. And you allowed him to help us move to our new house because he was the only, you know, and it continued. Right. So, now, so the, the, the message that I'm, that I'm conveying is you have to report this abuse mm-hmm. or it's not going to stop. And chances are the cycle will continue. So mm-hmm. in order to break the cycle of abuse, you have to report it. You have to put a stop to it. We can't continue to condone this behavior. That's accessory to a crime. Right. That is true. That's true. That's true. That's true. And I'm, I'm thank you so much for ans- answering that question because I think a lot of families in general and uh, friends friends because I mean although it happens more within families but it does happen sometimes by a a friend of the family but I think I think sometimes um people forget that you know fam the family structure and the happiness and the 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 general um the general environment feeling among the uh, the family environment is important but so is the victim and actually the victim is even more important because that's the person that's been harmed and i think that a lot of times people 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 or families in general just don't realize that you have to put more support to where the pain is at and the pain is the the major pain is is coming from the victim you know the family might fall apart but we you have to support the victims as well um and i and i not only only to support the victim but to to break the cycle to break the cycle because something is is, to get away with it with one then chances are he's going to do it or he or she is going to do it to somebody else within the family. Right. And then that person, that, that other person is not going to open up about it because they witnessed uh, the, uh, the previous victim, you know, be ignored. So to break the cycle, it's also important to break the cycle of abuse. Exactly. Wow. Wow, and that is just so, it is just, it is, it's such a touchy subject. It is such a touchy subject, and it's just like, it really, you know, it's such a touchy subject, but it has to be talked about, because you're right, the cycle has to be broken, and I mean, and you shouldn't have to wait for, for family members to fall off the face of the earth or die before the cycle is broken, you know, or, you know, the cycle has to be broken, and, um, I'm so glad that you are that you are a woman of God who's stepping up to her calling. It takes a lot of courage to even just endeavor into this type of um ministry, this type of nonprofit sector. I mean, again, it is I don't even like to say touchy, but it's a it's a it's a subject matter. It's a real life situation that's going on, and a lot of people just don't want to talk about it, you know. And you still, 
you still have people, even outsiders, when they have an opportunity to do something about it, they feel kind of like, oh, it's, it's not my business. I don't want to get involved with that, you know, or let me not get involved. So there's, there ha I, I, I know there, there are people out there that may have the opportunity to help, but because of the type of subject it is, they just, they withdraw and they feel like it, you know, it's not my family. It's not my, it's not, has, doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't want to get involved. Um, even with the domestic violence, I've noticed that with domestic violence, um, you have people that are out, you know, outsiders that just say, you know, I don't get, I won't get between a man and his wife, or I don't want to get in somebody else's business. But I think we all have a greater responsibility to make it our business to care, you know, to care a little bit more about other people and um the safety you know um because as you said p you did you just call it pts or pst post traumatic PTSD, PT post traumatic stress disorder that is really it's real suffering from that right it's real it's real and people don't understand why relationships are failing or why they can't remain employed or why they can't stay on one project or you know why they can't focus they don't understand what's going on they don't understand why they're so confused they don't understand a lot of things it's then you have some people who can't even really fully remember what happened to them but they do remember experiencing some type of stress whether it may have been to see uh, parents fighting or mother getting abused or you know seeing something very traumatic you know they may have been being talked to inappropriately or anything and they just don't understand what was going what's going on what went on they don't remember but they are experiencing the triggers as you said so you've given us a a lot of information and a lot of things that may be able to help some people identify that hey i have a you know i might be going through that i have a problem i'm i need to reach out to somebody so thank you so much for sharing those various examples with us because there, there are indeed many people who, uh, you know, maybe, may, maybe going through something and just don't know where to begin, you know. And, and um, hopefully, this information um, today that you shared may be able to help some people identify that now is the time for for me to get up and get some help or to talk to somebody else or to share, you know. And as you said, your your way to redemption was through um through your faith and your belief in God and and um Jesus Christ and you you turned to um to God for deliverance and um other people as you said may want to turn to counseling or or, or other outlets but hopefully they don't turn to hopefully they don't turn to drugs or something that could lead to more uh trauma in their lives so do you all have a general number that they can reach out to uh, Fortress of Hope, uh, Psalms 18? Uh, do you have a number or is the best way for them to reach out to you is through Facebook? The best way to, to reach, we don't have a, a number yet, but the best way to reach out to us is through email. Okay. Fortress of Hope, Psalms 18 at gmail.com. Um, we're very good at responding quickly, and um, you can also reach out to us through Facebook, through our, our fan page, send us a message. Um, we contact you immediately. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, darling, for taking the time to share with us your story, your testimony, your journey. Um, everything that you're doing with Fortress of Hope, Psalm 18, is uh, indeed a, a work, um, uh, is an amazing work, and I'm sure that um, you have a lot ahead of you, um, but it, I'm just asking anyone out there that's interested in supporting this nonprofit organization and Miss Clark with her endeavors, please do reach out to her. She's provided the email address. Again, that's Fortress of Hope Psalms 18 at gmail.com. If you are interested in supporting this nonprofit organization, please do reach out to Darlene Clark. Um, she can also be reached via Facebook uh, on the fan page. The fan page is Fortress of Hope Psalms 18. 
So if you are unable to uh, reach Miss Clark um, by any one of those means, you can also just shoot Enjoy Life Magazine and an email at info at enjoylifemagazine.com and we will certainly forward it to her but I'm quite sure she said they answer very quickly to their email so reach out to her if you want to support it you want to make a donation you want to support the the cause if you want to become a sponsor of any of the workshops or events that she's going to be hosting in the upcoming year Please reach out to her because this is a movement that definitely does require support. If you're, uh, 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 you know, if you're in the medical field, a therapist, or anything, reach out to Miss Miss Clark because I'm sure that she is going to um, be happy to receive um, the support from the community of Miami. And that's correct, right? You are based in Miami, Florida. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Is there anything else that you would like the public to know or share with us? Um, there was something <laughs> that I totally forgot. Um, but yes, please. Um, if there's any, we're also looking for volunteers. We're looking for volunteers, and we also um, uh, we also will be interviewing anyone that would love to become a um, a mentor. Because a lot of times um, victims, they need, especially the young, young, um, the young ones, they need a mentor. So if you're interested in becoming a volunteer or a mentor, um, please reach out to us. We will be um, conducting interviews by by the beginning of next year, and we will also be posting that up, that mm -hmm. information up. So if you want to um, sign up for that, we'll be more than happy to. Receive you. Wow. As an yeah. wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with me and my listeners and readers. I am so excited about getting um, this message of hope and redemption out there and healing because basically this is what it's all about. Um, restoration and healing and, and being able to move on with life yeah. productively. And it yeah. all starts with being able to relieve yourself of your, your past demons and struggles. And I'm just yeah. so glad that, again, I, I just want to thank you for just stepping up to your calling. Because every time somebody steps up to their calling and they use their time, talent, and treasure uh, in a positive way, it just helps us to to build a better a better day, a better tomorrow, you know, a better future, um, not only for ourselves, but for our communities at large. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me um, and allowing me to share my story and what this, this organization is all about. And I'm, I'm praying that we'll be able to be a blessing to many, many. And I hope that this raises uh, an awareness and that it will motivate our community, our society, to be proactive when it comes to fighting the cause against sexual child abuse and physical abuse. Wow. Well, you're quite welcome, and you definitely have Enjoy Life magazine as a support, um, as a media outlet, and so we're just we're here to support as well. So awesome. every you're quite welcome. So everybody, again, this has been Darling Clark. From, Hope, from Fortress of Hope, Psalms 18. Thank you all for tuning in today. And until next time, you know what to do. Live, love, laugh, and enjoy life.